cameras. We all have heard of them, we've all seen them, most of us carry them around in our back pocket. I'm here today to talk about cameras and how we use them in everyday life and how to get better at using them for the sake of photography and videography. When I'm talking about photography, I'm talking about cameras that you would see a, a photographer using, something like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, where there's usually a detachable lens of some sort. Today I'm going to be talking to you about using your camera on manual settings as opposed to automatic settings. Manual settings are something that you don't use very often with a phone camera or any camera that you would pick up at a consumer store. Manual settings are going to allow you to craft an image the way that you have it in your head, um, whether that be lighting scenarios or just a general stylistic photo that you have in your brain. The main ingredient to any good photography is light. Light is the bread and butter of photography. It, you can't have photography without light. The three main things I'm going to be teaching you about today all involve light. There are, I call it the trifecta. You have your aperture, you have your ISO, and you have your shutter speed. We'll start with your aperture. Your aperture is a mechanical disc in the inside of your lens most often. Some, some cameras have it within the body themselves, but it's a mechanical disc on the inside of your lens that you can adjust to let in more light or less light depending on the scenario. I'll put up a picture or an animation of an aperture. The aperture is measured by how open or how closed the mechanical disc is. We call these f-stops in photography. The higher the f-stop, the less light you're letting in, the more closed that disc is. The lower the f-stop, the more wide open the disc is and the more light you're letting in. Now this is important to know because you might need to communicate with somebody else how open or how closed your aperture has been or will be. And it's important for you to know personally because the amount of light you let in through the aperture determines, for one, how blurry your background is, and for two, how overexposed or underexposed your, your shot is. You'll see people using cameras all the time, but you always see these professional photographers who get these beautiful photos with this silky smooth background that's out of focus. And you, you think to yourself, how do, they, how do they achieve that kind of blurry background? And the blurry background we call in photography bokeh. It's a Japanese word. This bokeh it can be achieved by a wider f-stop or a smaller f-stop. The wider the aperture you, you have, the more out of focus your background is going to be, the more bokeh you have. Now that can be challenging because you can have bokeh that's so incredibly blurry that your, your focus plane, where you're pulling focus, is so incredibly thin that it's very difficult to actually focus on what you're trying to focus on. Lenses come in all shapes and sizes, and it's really difficult to determine which lens you want for your camera. Now, depending on how much money you have to spend, lenses are usually an afterthought, but in reality, it's probably the most important part of your kit. A lens can determine how sharp your image is and how much light you can let into the camera. Again, that's important for your bokeh. Most consumer grade lenses that you're going to buy, the cheaper stuff, they only open up to an f4.0, which isn't horrible, but you can get lenses that open up to a 1.4 or a 1.2. That's really wide for a lens. It's about as wide as you can get. Right now, in the lens I'm using right now, is an f1.4. You can see how out of focus my background is, where as opposed to an f4.0, most of the background behind me would be in focus along with my face. Now, it's not a bad thing. You could see my background more clearly, but there is a stylistic aspect to it where it just looks good to have the background slightly out of focus. You can spend more money on these lenses and get these really wide apertures to get this kind of out of focus background. The wider your lens opens means that it usually won't close as far either. Like a bright sunny day like it is today, you can go out with your camera and you start shooting things and you see that everything's overexposed. It's very bright and white and you can't decide why that is. Well, you can't close your aperture far enough because you have a, a wider opening aperture unless you spend the extra amount of money. You're not going to be able to close your aperture far enough to be able to block out that extra light you're getting from the sun. Now this is important because you're not going to be able to see anything. 
there are things that you can put on the end of your lens uh, called an ND filter that acts like sunglasses for your lens. It's very easy for you to be able to block out that extra sunlight that your aperture can't and you can still be open at a higher aperture or a lower aperture and get that out of focus background while maintaining the correct exposure. Now that's all just aperture. There are two other things I want to discuss, shutter speed and ISO. We'll talk about ISO last because that's something that people get confused often on. Your shutter speed is reliant on your shutter. That's that normal clicking noise you hear when you imagine a photo being taken. Your shutter speed determines how quickly that shutter is closing and opening in your camera. That's what captures that moment for a photo. It's exposing a certain amount of light to the sensor for a certain amount of time, capturing that image still inside the camera. Your shutter speed can determine how much blurriness is in your photo. With a very low shutter speed, you're gonna be leaving your sensor exposed for a greater amount of time, and if anything moves in that time period or the camera moves in that time period, you're going to be experiencing motion blur because the, what you're shooting isn't standing still and it's exposed to the sensor that, for that entire time so it can bleed and cause that motion blur. With a higher shutter speed, you don't experience blurriness. The higher the shutter speed, the more crisp and clear your photo is gonna be, so you usually, generally, are going to wanna have a higher shutter speed for that crisp, sharp image that you're going for. Some people stylistically prefer to have a low shutter speed, so you do get that motion blur. It's all dependent on what you want as a photographer. You can play around with these manual settings and decide what you want as an artist or a photographer for your final image to look like. All cameras have different shutter speeds and they can go to very high shutter speeds with more expensive cameras, but with the less expensive cameras, you can get generally up to about 4,000, one over 4,000 shutter speed. That's pretty quick. Shutter speed is measured in two different ways. It can be measured in seconds. So I can say that I have a one over 4,000th second of a shutter speed. That means that it takes one 4,000th of, of a second for my shutter to come down and go back up. That's how much exposure time I have on my image sensor. The second way to measure your shutter speed is just by the number itself. I usually don't say it like a fraction, I just say I'm at a shutter speed of 4,000 or 8,000 in my case. I like to shoot at 8,000. Those are very, very high shutter speeds, so you need a lot of light to be able to shoot with that. But when you have a wider aperture, a nicer lens on your camera, and are letting all that extra light in, you can afford to shoot at those higher shutter speeds. Last but not least, we'll talk about ISO. ISO is confusing for a lot of people because ISO actually is an acronym for something that has nothing to do with what it means. ISO stands for International Organization for Standardization. And again, that has nothing to do with what that actually does inside your camera. Your ISO determines the sensitivity of your light sensor, meaning your image sensor inside of your camera. Your camera can determine how sensitive that sensor inside of it is determining how much light is required for a properly exposed image. You can always think back to a grainy image that you've seen. A grainy image is usually associated with a high ISO. You're bumping up the sensitivity of your image sensor inside your camera, and so it's way more sensitive to light, but the side effect of that is causing a grainy image. It's a lot of color noise that a lot of people don't really like in their photos. They want it to be as crisp and clear as it possibly can be. And if you bump your ISO high enough, not only is it gonna be grainy and noisy, but you're gonna to start to lose detail. It's gonna be very blurry and not as sharp. Your ISO can come in handy. A lot of these newer cameras are able to bump their ISO up very high without any sort of side effect, which is great for low light shooting scenarios, mostly at night or inside a room that doesn't have very many windows. Your ISO can be a lifesaver for those situations, so you can still maintain a wide aperture and a high shutter speed and still not be underexposed in a scenario where you don't have nearly as much light. You have to be careful with your ISO though because if you bump it up too high, you're gonna be way too noisy and way too grainy. You have to be conscious of that fact, it's a give and take. And that's why I call it a trifecta. You have to be conscious of your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO all at the same time and determine the balance between them to get the best shot possible. Do you want a really out of focus background? You want to have that bokeh? Well, you're going to need a high or a wide aperture. But then where does that leave you with your shutter speed? You're going to still be able to shoot at a high shutter speed, but maybe you're wanting to go for a blurrier shutter or a blurrier photo, meaning you're going to have a lower shutter speed. Well, if you have a low shutter speed 
and a wide open aperture, you're gonna have way overexposed photos and that doesn't look as good. Mostly you can't even see what's going on in the photo. Same thing with your ISO. If you have that bumped up super high and you're overexposed, you're just gonna be grainy, it's not gonna look good. You have to determine what you want your photo to look like and what are the settings required to make it look that way. It's gonna take a lot of practice. It's gonna take a lot of trial and error, but eventually you're gonna get the hang of the three of them. And once you do, you're gonna feel like a master of your camera. You're gonna be able to go in, know exactly what the photo is in your brain and how to get there because you know how to use the different settings on your camera. Now there are a lot of different settings on most cameras and I'm gonna cover those settings in a later video. But for now, the main three that you need to keep in mind are your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. And we'll talk about how they relate to video again in a later episode, but for now, basics of photography, keep that trifecta in mind.